in John chapter 12 this morning, begin reading in verse number 23. John chapter 12, verse 23, you find these words. Now Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come. The Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the corn of wheat fall unto the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for your blessings. We thank you for who you are this morning. Lord, I pray this morning as we opened up the word of God that Lord, you would speak to us this morning in a very meaningful way. Lord, I pray that the Spirit would have freedom this morning. Lord, I pray this morning that Lord, I would say the words you'd have me to speak, nothing more, nothing less. Lord, I pray that hearts would be responsive, and that we would be obedient to the Spirit of God this morning. And may your name be honored and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Past several weeks, of course, since the beginning of the new year, we've talked about the Great Adventure. Well, over the next two or three weeks, we're going to take a break from the Great Adventure and really focus on why we have the Great Adventure, if you will. In just a couple of Sundays, we'll be celebrating Easter. So what I like to do is today, next week, and Easter Sunday, focus on this part of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And... Um, I want to bring your attention to this passage of Scripture and bring your attention to a few thoughts this morning. What I want to do is, first of all, give you some, some background, some context, understand what's going on here, uh, and encourage you to read this on your own. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the, the majority of the book of John only covers just a few days. Um, starting with chapter about 13, from chapter 13 to the end, all that just deals with the Last Supper, the Passion Week, that's part of the Passion Week, and then his death, burial, resurrection, just a matter of a few days. So the majority of the book of, of John is devoted to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And as we're going to see, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, all really take place in just a matter of hours. And so this morning we're talking about the final hours, the final hours of the life of Christ. Now, we know today he lives forever. But it's final hours of life before he dies upon the cross for our sins. Now, notice in your Bible the context. I'm going to give you a broader context this morning. Going back to chapter number 11, we have what we remember as the resurrection of Lazarus. Remember that? Now, that's playing up to, that's playing into the death of Christ. If you go back and read parallel passages, you'll, you'll find that before he goes to raise Lazarus from the dead, Jesus is on the other side of the Jordan River. His disciples are very happy about that because on this side of the Jordan River, they want to kill him. So they're very happy to be on the other side. And then the word comes to Jesus saying that Lazarus is sick. Well, he stays there for a while. Three days, we know, remember? And then he finally says to the disciples, well, let's go. Well, if you read the passage of Scripture, they're not happy about that. Number one is, you know, we don't want to go back there because... That's, that's the frying pan, man, that we're in trouble. You can't go over there. But then of all people, Thomas steps up and says, boys, let's go. If we die with him, we die with him. That's a tremendous testimony. You know what Thomas was saying there, right? I would rather die with him than live without him. So if he's going, I'm going with him. And if it costs me my life, so be it. I'd rather die with Jesus than live without him. So then he goes. Of course, we know he raises Lazarus from the dead. Everybody's real happy about that, right? No, they're not. Matter of fact, if you look at chapter 11, verse 45, it says, And many of the Jews which came to Mary, 
and have seen the things that Jesus did, believed on him. That's great. Then there's verse 46. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus had done. A bunch of tattletalers. They went back to the Pharisees. You won't believe what Jesus did. He raised Lazarus from the dead. You, you, can you hear it? That plays in because the very next verse says, verse 47, Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doth many miracles. You keep reading. They're beginning to now plot how to kill Jesus. Do you understand how raising Lazarus from the dead plays into his death? They begin to plot. Keep reading and you'll find Judas is very glad to help them out. Okay? So we come to chapter 12. We find that now it's just a few days before the Passover. And of course, Jesus, remember, is crucified during the Passover time. So six days before then, there's a supper at Bethany. And guess who's there? Lazarus. You think it drew a crowd? Yeah, he was the guest of honor. Everybody wanted to see Lazarus. The guy who was dead, now he's up walking around and he's going to eat. Yeah. And some other some Pharisees are there too. Because the Pharisees, they want to see it and they're not very happy about it. He should still be dead. Who, who gave him the authority to raise people from the dead? God. He is God. So, I notice, we get to this, of course, in the second part of chapter 12. We have the triumphal entry. He marches into Jerusalem. They're praising him, singing Hosanna. And then we find the words that we read this morning. Now, I want to remind you how many, if you've read the gospel account, you know several times throughout Jesus' life, he says, mine hour is not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. Notice the words we read this morning. He says, the hour is come. He knows what's about to take place. He knows that the hour is come. The time of his death is drawing very near. And as this takes place, he says in verse number 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? And of course, he, asked, he said, you know, do I say, Father, save me from this hour? No. This is the whole reason that I came. I came for this very hour. I came to die for the sins of mankind. Now, I want you to think for a moment, what if you knew your time was coming? Now, Jesus here, he's in perfect health, right? He's, he's not on his deathbed. We're not doing anything like that. But he knows his time is coming. If we knew today that just in a few days our life was going to cease, we're not going to get sick, we're not going to, but we know in a few days God's going to call us home. If you knew that, what would you do, with, let's just say between now and Thursday. You knew Thursday was the day. What would you do between now and Thursday? Uh, immediately, some things popping into your mind of things that, I mean, if you're really serious, things that you would take care of. Things that maybe you've put off for a while. You know, you, you've been thinking about getting your will fixed and you hadn't done that yet. Well, that would be a priority, wouldn't it? People, maybe you have family you haven't seen in a while, you go see them. There'd probably be some conversations you would have that you've been putting off that you would definitely have with family members because you know the time will be drawing very close. I want you to understand here, Jesus says, The hour is come. And in the next few chapters, he's spending it with his disciples. He's going to have the Last Supper with them. He's going to communicate some things to them. A lot of it is not new. It's things he discussed before, but he's emphasizing it. He's letting them know, hey, the hour is come. The time is here. There's some things you need to know. And this morning, I want to talk to you about those things just very briefly, some things he communicated to his disciples that it's clear he's communicating to us as well. I want you to grasp that as we come to this time of year where we're getting ready to come into Easter, remembering the resurrection of our Savior. As we look at this uh, account here, notice first of all, as he's talking about, he says, what should I say? Now the Father save me from this hour. No, that's not the case. For this hour came out to this, for this cause came out to this hour. Notice he says, keep reading. The first thing I want you to notice is that as he communicates to his disciples, starting in verse number 31, he communicates to them his purpose. He reminds them of his purpose. Look at verse 31. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death 
he should die. The people answered, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever, and what sayest thou? The Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is the Son of Man? Well, who is the Son of Man? He's speaking of himself. So notice here, he speaks of the purpose of his death. Notice he says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Go back to verse 31. I skipped verse 31. It says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Notice two purposes for his death. Verse 31, the first purpose is to destroy Satan. So his judgment is now. You, you understand when Jesus died, that was judgment. Sin was judged. Now you can take his judgment because he took it for you, or you can take it on yourself. It's your choice. He died taking the judgment for sin, the punishment for sin, and we can accept that for ourselves, or we can reject it, and one day we'll face that judgment on our own. But he says here in verse 31, Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Who's the prince of this world? Satan. His death destroyed Satan. Now it's yet to happen. We understand that. But this is fulfilled from back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it was told to us that from the seed of the woman, that seed would bruise the head of Satan. When Jesus died on the cross, that was the death blow to Satan. Now, Satan's still running around, but he's on a very short leash. His time is coming. But Satan knows God has his number, and his time is coming. It's already been settled. It's a done deal. Not only did he come to destroy Satan, but then verse number 31, he came to draw all men unto him. So he reminds them of his purpose to destroy Satan, but also to draw all men to himself. The cry of Jesus today is still, whosoever will, let him come. He died for all men of all time. So he reminds them of his purpose in death, but he also reminds them of his purpose in life. Look at verse 44. Notice his purposes in life. Jesus cried and said, he that believeth on me, Believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. The first purpose was to give us light, to give light. John accounted for that in the very first chapter. He is the light. What light did he come to give us? The light to show us that we're in darkness, that we're sinners, we have no hope except in him. He came to give light. Not only that, verse, 40, verse 47, And if any man hear my words and believe me, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but, here's a second purpose, to save the world. He came to save the world. He didn't come to judge it, but he came to judge sin. He took upon himself that judgment on the cross of Calvary. He came to save the world. Then there is thirdly, verse 49 and 50. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, speak as the Father, or even as, as the Father saith unto me, so I speak. There is the third purpose was simply to obey the Father. So his purpose in his death, his purpose in his death, to destroy Satan, to draw him into himself. He reminds them of his purpose in life, to give light, to save the world, and to obey the Father. It's interesting to me, and it's a challenge to me, I don't know about you, but verse 50, when Christ himself says, I know that his commandment is life everlasting. That is truth, is it not? So if his commandment is life everlasting, why do I disobey? That's the thought that comes to mind, why do I disobey? If I know that his commandment is life everlasting, why in the world would I want to disobey? But he reminds them here as he's facing his final hours of his purpose. Notice not only his purpose, but then we come to, of course, chapter 13. We have uh, the Last Supper, as we call it. He washes the disciples' feet. He talks about his betrayal, his death. And, of course, the end of, verse, end of chapter 13, uh, verse 36 and verse 37, we see Peter gets very upset. In fact, read those, follow along with me as we read those verses. It says, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, 
whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Would thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow until thou hast denied me thrice. You understand Peter's upset here. This isn't the first time Peter has heard this. But this is the first time I think it sinks in. And he's upset. You're leaving. You're going to go. And I can't follow you. What, this, this can't be. I'll lay down my life for you. And of course, Jesus prophesies, well, before tomorrow morning, you're going to deny me three times. You understand that's the context of chapter 14 where he says, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. Do you understand why he says that now? Because Peter, the leader of the group, is upset. So Peter, he says, listen, don't worry about it. Don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, see, I have a purpose. Yes, I, I came to this world in life to give light, to, to save the world, to obey the Father. And in my death, which is I'm telling you is going to come very soon, I'm coming to destroy Satan, to draw all men into me. I know you're worried about it. That's my purpose, but I want you to understand there's peace. So he gets his purpose, but he also gives peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We know this passage of Scripture. He gives them his purpose. In giving them his purpose, he upsets them. If a loved one came to you and told you, on the Thursday, the Lord's going to take me home. And they were sincere, and you could look in their eyes, and you know, they're not teasing, they're not crazy, that they really believe that on Thursday, they're going to take their last breath, and that's the last time you'll see them. Would that not upset you? To know that you're getting ready to lose someone that you love. That's Peter's response, is it not? What would that loved one try to do at that point, do you think? Would they not try to offer peace? Isn't that what our Savior does? Let not your heart be troubled. Don't, don't worry. I've got something for you. It's going to be okay. You can have peace. And not only that, not only am I going to give you peace, but notice this, i got a place for you. Because, yes, I'm going to leave, but i got a reservation for you. And you can meet me there. So he tells them about his purpose. Then he tells them, I've got peace for you, and not only peace, I've got a place for you. Because notice in Jesus' response in chapter 13 to Peter, Thou canst not follow me now. No, you can't follow me right now, Peter. But there's coming a day we'll meet again. He gives them his purpose. He offers them his peace, giving us, of course, indication of our place going to prepare a place for us. Then notice when we come to chapter 15, we'll come back to 14 in a minute, the thought that's given to us in 14 that's described later. But in chapter 15, he gives them not only his purpose, his peace, describing our place, but then he gives them provision. Notice chapter 15, verse 1. I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman. Let's get down to verse 4. Or sorry, verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. In verse 5, when he says, without me, you can do nothing, I don't think that was a surprise, because I think that's exactly what they were thinking. Because remember, even though it's a different chapter, this is just... These are the last hours they're spending with him. This is the same conversation that's taking place. Listen, boys, I've told you before, but I'm, I'm, uh, understand this. The hour is come. I've told you before, it's not yet. I'm telling you, it is here, it is right now. The time of my death is almost here. 
We don't want to hear that. that. That's upsetting. I understand that. Let me give you peace. Give you a reservation. You'll meet me there. And I want you to understand. I know you've got a lot of questions. You're going to wonder, how in the world can you do this without me? I know, you know, you can't. You can't do it without me. That's why I want you to understand. I am the vine. You're the branches. As long as you abide in me, even though, yes, you won't see me anymore, but if you abide in me, that is your provision. That is how you can do it. That's how you can make it without seeing me every day. You can make it. You have provision. Once again, going with our illustration, if someone came to you, a loved one, give you the upsetting news. They try to comfort you, give you peace. If it's a potential, uh, particularly like a patriarch in the family, many times they'll maybe explain to you how they made provision for the family for this time that's coming. They planned. They planned ahead. This is where this is. This is where this is. This is how this is going to be taken care of. This is how this is going to be taken care of. And I've made arrangements so when I'm gone, this is all provided. You understand what Jesus is doing here? I understand you have a lot of questions. There's a lot of concerns. But I'm telling you, everything you need has been provided already. You just have to simply abide in me. Now, as soon as you fail to do that, yes, you're going to realize once again that yes, you can't do anything without me. I know you can't see me. You can't walk with me. But I'm still here. As long as you abide in me, you have every thing you need. I provided it all already. So he tells them his purpose, gives them peace. Then he tells them of his provision. Then notice, when we get to chapter 16, he focuses on his partner. Who is this partner? Well, he's introduced to us actually in chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 16, I will pray the Father, he shall send you another comforter. He comes back to him in chapter 16, verse um, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. Jesus says, hey, listen, I know I'm leaving. But I got good news. I got a partner who's going to come who's going to take my place. He said, well, Jesus, nobody can take your place. Oh, yes, you can, because it's another comforter. It's another of the same kind. He's just as much God as I'm God. And, yes, he may not walk with you the way I did, but you know what? He's going to dwell in you. He's going to give you all that you need. He's going to teach you everything that you need. Because remember, what are they facing here? Well, they're facing sorrow at this point of the news that's been given, have they not? The beginning of chapter 6 is great news. Let's look at this. Uh, there's this wonderful news he just tells them. These things have I spoken unto you. He should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Woo, that's great news. Praise the Lord. Yea, the time cometh that whereby whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Oh, that's great. Jesus, isn't that wonderful? And these things they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. What's he telling us is coming in, in the first part of chapter 16? These aren't things we shout and praise the Lord for, is it? He tells them, hey, listen, I know you're upset about the bad news I gave you, but understand, you know, they hate me. They're going to hate you too. They're going to put me to death. Guess what? Some of you, same thing. They're going to put you to death. But on the heels of this news that gives them sorrow, the heels of this news, they're going to be persecuted. What does he tell them? It'll be okay. I've got someone I've got a partner that's going to carry you through it, the Holy Spirit. He's your comforter. He's going to come and dwell in you. He will never, ever leave you. So he tells them of his partner. He's the comforter in sorrow and the persecution. And then he continues in verse number 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will teach you the truth. You have questions. I don't have enough time here to give you all the answers. But my partner, when he comes, he'll teach you all truth. So he gives them his purpose, his peace, his provision. He speaks of his partner, the Holy Spirit, coming to live within us. And then probably one of my favorite chapters in Scripture, chapter 17. For it is truly the Lord's Prayer. 
Understand the setting here. Chapter 13 was the Last Supper. Chapter 13, 14, 15, 16. That's all taking place at the Lord's Supper. And then Satan or Judas is dismissed, remember? Then they leave themselves. These conversation, this conversation is taking place as they have left the Last Supper and they're on the way. They're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. So there's several chapters here, but it's all taking place on this walk from the Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane. On the way there, they have to pass by the temple. And in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking that it's not there in Scripture. It's just my sanctified imagination. I can imagine as he is walking through the streets of Jerusalem, he passes the temple and he sees the temple. And him being God of gods, the king of kings and lord of lords, he is now our high priest, right? He is our high priest. Knowing all of this, chapter 17, he offers for us what is truly the Lord's Prayer and what is typically referred to as the high priestly prayer of Christ. This is him talking to his father. And when he does, he talks to his father about his disciples, those 12 that are with him, actually the 11 now that are with him because Judas is left. But he also is talking about us. I encourage you to read the chapter because he mentions us. And he offers this prayer for us. I don't have time to read it all this morning. I'm going to read just portions of it. As he offers this prayer, he points out some things that he prays for you and for me. Verse number 11. Now remember, this is his final hours. And what is he thinking of? Not himself, but the 11 that are with him, and specifically in chapter 17, us that are sitting here today. In verse 11, he says, And now I am no more in the world. He's speaking to the Father. But these are in the world. And I am come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. There's in the middle of that verse. Keep them through or keep them, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. Notice he prays that we are kept. He prays for our security. I praise God I'm secure this morning. No doubts about where I'm going to spend eternity. I am kept by the power of God. He prays here in this prayer, he prays for our security. Let's get down to verse number 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. You know what he prays for in verse 15? He says, I'm, he's already said, I'm leaving this world. I'm not praying that you'll take them out. They're here, they're going to stay. But I'm praying that as they're here, give them victory. Give them victory. He knows what you and I struggle with every day. He says, these are in the world, they're going to stay in the world. I'm praying that you'll give them victory. Keep them from the evil. He prays for our victory. Then notice in verse 17. He says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. He prays for our sanctification. The fact that we'll be more and more like Christ every day. We'll have victory after victory after victory over sin in our lives so we can be the Christian God would have us to be. He prays for our sanctification. Then in verse 21, verse 21, that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He prays for security, for victory, for our sanctification, and then in verse 21, he prays for our unity, that they may be one. What do you mean by that, Jesus? I want you to be one just like the Father and I are one. That's a pretty high standard. But he prays that for us. He's praying to the Father. Father, I'm praying that they will be one. They'll be united as one like you and I are one. Not so that they can glory in it, but so the world can see. So the world can see and believe. And then verse 24 he says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, 
be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now, I don't know, once in my sanctified imagination, if, if this was a formal prayer service, which it's not, he's, I, can just, I can see Jesus praying. He's kind of looking over at Peter, praying for you, buddy. I'm praying one day you can be with me so you can see me in my real glory. I know you were upset I was going to be gone, but I'm praying for you, buddy. Because one day I'm praying, I'm praying for you because one day I'm praying you'll be glorified. You won't have to worry about, Peter, I know you're going to be upset tomorrow morning. When that rooster crows, oh, man, your heart's going to break. And I'm praying for you, but I'm praying that you'll be sanctified, and I'm praying one day you'll be glorified. You don't have to worry about that sin nature anymore. Don't worry about sticking your foot in your mouth anymore. You're going to be glorified, and you're going to be where I am. Be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Peter, James, and John got a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration, didn't they? One of Peter thinks today, he sees Jesus in his true glory. May he prays for us here that we'll be glorified one day. See him in his true glory. As we think this morning about the final hours of Jesus, and we can relate this morning as hopefully we, we have been able to do with our illustration of someone coming to us and letting them know that their time is coming, how they would try to provide a peace, how they've made preparations for us and made provision for us, and maybe even in their strength would even pray for us knowing that if they're saved, they're going to a better place. They're not worried about it. But for you, you're stuck here. You still have to deal with life. Isn't that what Jesus does here? Do we see the heart of God here? How much he loves us? My question this morning is this. Maybe it's your question. Preacher, why would you say all that? Oh, it, it's, I understand it. It's great. I mean, I, I see that, but what well, really I think it goes back to chapter 12, our opening text. And where we read in verse 49. For the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Jesus knew his final hours were coming. He knew these words would be recorded. He recorded it for us today so we could see more intimately possibly his heart, his love for us. But what, what do we need to draw from that today? As we sit here at Community Baptist Church. Do you understand? The heart of God breaks because God wants more for us than we want for ourselves. Have you ever been a good leader in a position of leadership, whether that's a parent or some other avenue of life. You know, many times the difficulties of life are summed up in that one statement. You want better for them than they want for themselves. Now, it's not a matter of living your life through them. But that's wrong. They have their own life. They should live their own life. But as parents, myself today, as a pastor, many of you in other positions of leadership, we see the potential in people. And we know what they can do. And we try to prepare them for what they can accomplish. And knowing how God can work in them. And we see, we can see what God would do if they would just let him. 
but we find ourselves heartbroken because we want more for them than they want for themselves. They're content to live what we look at as miserable. They're content to live here. And you're thinking, but why? You could have this. If you just would let God do it. You understand what God has planned for us? You understand that his commandment is life? Then why do we keep disappointing him? Why are we content to live the way we're living? Why aren't we charging the mountains and getting a closer experience with God? Why are we content to, to live in the sin that he despises? Why is it that in our minds, to serve God, we have to let everything else go? And there's so much to give up. Really? Is that what he tells us here? That serving him is just misery? Misery? You have to give up all this fun stuff and just serve this drudgery life for me. Why do we live that way? When we know it's the opposite. He's told us right here how much he loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he's provided for us. But somehow in our minds we think, I can't be that way. I can do better. No, you can't. No, I can't. God wants so much more for us. And he tells us here in his final hours, as he talks to his disciples, how much he wants for us, how much he's done for us. But yet, we don't want it. We're content where we are. We think that, preacher, you just don't understand. The sin that I'm having is so much fun. It really is. It's so much fun. You just can't imagine how much fun. I'm having a blast right now. Yeah, wait till it catches up with you. And you know it. It's going to ruin your life. It's going to ruin your marriage. It's going to take your kids way down the wrong path because they see it. They may not know specifically what's going on, but they see it. They know something's there. And if it's not important enough for mom and dad, it's not important to me. God wants so much more. For us, why don't we just take him at his word, lay everything else down, and say, God, you know, I'm going to trust you. I don't, I'm going to know how. Did Peter know how? Peter was upset. The Lord just, don't worry, but don't be troubled. I've got it all taken care of. I can give you peace because I'm taking you to a place. You're going to meet me there. And I've provided everything you need in the meanwhile. Just trust me. I've got it all laid out. If you just follow this, oh, you'll, mm, you just can't imagine what I have for you. Why can't we take that? I want to encourage you this morning. If Jesus took his final hours and spoke to his disciples, speaks to us this morning, whatever is in your life, whatever you haven't surrendered to him and he's talking to you right now about it, don't put him off. Just come up here and say, God, I'm going to do it. The sin that you're struggling with, you realize it's not worth it. Oh, it's fun right now. The Bible tells us there's pleasure in sin for a season. You know what happens after that season? Then you begin to reap what you sowed. That's not fun. Just take God at his word. Say, God, I know what I'm doing is wrong. I'll admit, it's fun, but I know it's wrong. Help me to lay it down. Help me to forsake it, because I understand it's wrong. And leave it there. He wants more for us than we want for ourselves. It doesn't have to be that way. We can come to him this morning, and I trust that you will. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you once again for your precious word. Lord, you spent the final hours before your death 
communicating with your disciples and communicating with us through your word. Lord, I pray that we would understand the purpose of it all. Lord, I trust this morning that the Holy Spirit has had freedom or that hearts have been challenged. Lord, I pray this morning that they will respond accordingly. Lord, I pray that you would have your way in the time of invitation. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this morning I just want to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, if you're sitting here this morning and you've heard the, these last words of Jesus in the final hours and you realize and would admit today that, preacher, I, I don't know this morning that if I were to die that I would that I would go to heaven. I just really don't know that. I'm not certain about it. And, I, and I'm concerned about it. Would you pray for me? If, if, if that's you this morning, if you're concerned about where you would spend eternity, you're not sure that heaven will be your home, would you just raise your hand and let me pray for you? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to come to you where you are or anything. I just want to pray for you this morning. Anyone like that this morning said, Preacher, I do not know, and I want you to pray for me. I don't know. I will just pray for me. Anyone like that? This morning, Christian, with heads bowed and eyes closed, how many would raise their hand this morning and say, Preacher, pray for me because I know some things I need to get right in my life, some things I need to give up. There's even maybe some sin I need to confess. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand this morning? We put those hands down. In a moment, we're going to sing. Before we do, I just want you to simply bow your head. I want you to pray. Pray to the Lord that the Spirit of God would have freedom in your heart right now to reveal to you things that need to be revealed and that you would have the courage to deal with it this morning. Would you pray that prayer? Go stand to your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. Miss Jane's going to play. He plays I Surrender All. Would you come this morning as she plays?